have Lachlan. Howdy. And Ruben. Good evening. Ooh, good so evening. Formal. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm guessing being so formal, you're not drinking a beer. What is no. your beverage of choice this evening? Uh, it's a glass of milk. <laughs> a glass of milk. Is it a white Russian or is it just milk? No, it's just milk. Just milk. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I had a, I had a work a uh, Chris, I had a work Christmas party last night and probably drank more than enough for the entire weekend. So I thought I'd give it a miss tonight. Fair Sensible enough. Sensible choice. Sensible choice. Um, well, I've actually had a fair bit of alcohol over the last few days as well. We just got back from a trip to the Mudgee uh, wine region uh, with my wife and uh, two of her brothers and their, their partners. And I was designated driver for every day, um, which was my strategy to keep my alcohol intake on the minimum. Um, but then I would play catch up a little bit each night. So... <laughs> didn't have any any messy nights but um i certainly had a few nights where i had more than one drink and um so tonight i'm having a furfy ale just to keep it nice and light there you go how about you lachlan what are you having uh i've got a aiki uh japanese gin which mm. is Ooh. nice mm. with a tonic or just gin yeah with the tonic I'm not you one for so. Do you see how full that glass was? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not straight, Jim. <laughs> if it is, we'll have problems saying um, things like timocracy and, uh, and aristocracy. And aristocracy. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, you started with the easy one first. So it was a good warm up. Good well, I was reading it as timo- uh, timocracy because my name is Tim and I just visualized that's what I'm going to call my form of governance in my household from now on whenever my children say why do i have to do that thing dad because this is a timocracy yeah (laughs) and you will do as you are told (laughs) it's uh starting to sound like tyranny there tim (laughs) timony timony (laughs) however we can fit the word tim in there to make it work (laughs) um okay so before we start looking at chapter eight um couple of things uh first is we've had a bit of a numbers explosion on our facebook group which is exciting a lot of people starting to join up um so if you're listening and you've joined uh during the week welcome to you um we're glad to have you aboard and it's a little bit uh surprising for me um that lots of people are joining in on the listen but um it's exciting too and you know we're we're happy to have you so welcome aboard yeah, I guess uh, like when we started this thing, it was just uh, something to keep ourselves occupied as much as anything through uh, through COVID and a, a chance for us to all, you know, think and talk about a few things. But uh, it's nice to see other people appreciate it as well. So yeah, welcome along. Yeah, I think it's good. Uh, so before we kick this off, we were going to have a quick discussion, Ruben, around uh, this this method that's getting used in this chapter. Um, did you want to talk about that or introduce that idea for us? Oh, uh, we might. The, the chapter kicks off with a bit of a summary, so I might just hit that first. Um, yeah, let's do that. I'm happy to, happy to read from my translation. But essentially, they get to the point in this book and they're just like, okay, so we're finally here. This is what we agree the ideal society is. And he gives us a little summary, which is quite good. Um, so he says... Uh, uh, we have, a, we have agreed then, Glaucon, is that in the perfect state, women and children would be held in common, that men and women should share the same education and the same occupations, both in peace and war, and that they should be governed by those of their number who are best at philosophy and war. Uh, we have agreed that too, that when our rulers are appointed, they will take the soldiers and settle them in accommodation of the kind we described, there will be no private quarters, but everything is in common to all. And besides these arrangements for accommodation, you will remember that we said about what we said about property. Um, it was basically that uh, the the guardians will have communal property, and you know they won't have anything more than what they need uh, to, to survive. Um, so that's roughly the outline of the state, I think. Hmm. 
Oh, and they call this, and uh, for the rest of the chapter, they call for the rest of this particular book or chapter, whatever you want to call it, they call it uh, they call it aristocracy. Yeah. Okay. So that's one of those big words that uh, we're going to struggle to say if we drink too much gin. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking for me. It's all good. <laughs> um, yeah. So th th that's where they sort of hit, and then um, they. Uh, I think Glaucon or maybe Adamantus, one of the two, re re basically reminds Socrates that uh, this was a tangent. We're now sort of back where we wanted to be. Where do we go from here? And he says, well, the whole point of this was to look at uh, what a just state was so that we could see what a just person is and then we could decide, um, you know, what's more beneficial to be just or unjust. Um, so that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of roughly where we're at, I think. Yeah, that's a good summary. Yeah. Um, look, yeah, so we sort of had a bit of a chat during the week and it sort of popped up. Um, they go back to this method of looking at the macro, the state, to try to understand justice in the state and then to then from there try to just understand justice in the individual. So they almost sort of go a little steps further here where they sort of, they, just, they start discussing these different types of government and then essentially what Socrates does is says, well, there's these types of governments, which means then there are also these types of individuals and then they share uh, all of the, uh, the, the, they share the same attributes. And and that was sort of the question um, that we were, we were sort of thinking about, like, is that really a valid, like, is that really a valid method? So do you guys have any thoughts on that before I give mine? Only, I think, um, you know, they did actually, open up talking about that, um, you know, there'd be as many different types of government as there are types of people and that governments are a reflection on the, on the population. And uh, I think it's interesting. They sort of say that, but then I suppose when you're looking at an individual within a government sort of system, obviously it's a generalization of, possibly all of the best or all of the worst attributes of it. Um, and so it's kind of hard to sort of say that necessarily everybody, because everyone's an individual still, you know, within any government or any system. And um, you're going to have, uh, you know, good, bad extremes or, you know, soft liners or what have you as well. So um, it's interesting. I, I think it allows you to kind of expand on um, what your thoughts are about that, what, that government and what somebody might look like. But to sort of say that's what somebody within one of those sort of government situations is like, you know, maybe doesn't quite hit the mark. It's yeah. good as an example. So it's a stereotype. Yeah, well, almost. Yeah. Well, I think I think where it does work, where or I do agree with it, is he they, he kind of says, well, governments are not made of rocks and wood. Governments mm. are made of people. So for a style of government to exist, then the attributes of that government must have come from the individuals that make that government up so i think that's um i, I think i think that actually kind of makes sense the, the bit that i'm not real sure about is um whether you can look at the cons the cons constituents of a government that the, the working parts and say that oh that's exactly the same as the individual like i would accept that there are individual yeah. people and they have individual attributes and they would make up a government and the aspects of the government have to come from the people. They don't come from nowhere. I'm just not, I'm not entirely sure that you can sort of almost, and I know they've kind of did it in an earlier chapter. So they've, we were almost already blown past this point, but um, they, just the idea that uh, the different parts of a state are the same as the different parts of an individual. I just, I, I don't think that quite adds up. Well, it's also just because they're, in some of these examples we're going through here, you know, they're saying that the state may well be divided between different types of people according to where the power is lying. And so obviously you're going to have different people at one end of the scale in that system versus people at the other end of the scale in that system as well. Um, yeah. And you'd think the behaviours are going to be different at, at different ends of it. So, But, I mean, maybe they're just sort of talking more about the people who are sort of pursuing power perhaps in those states is maybe... I think what they're focusing on. It could also be. Yeah, I think you're right. Oh, sorry, I was going to say it could also be that they're just identifying maybe things that would be uniquely different to people in that type of government. So someone's 
like the, the problems say described in one form of government let's let's just say it's dem dem democratic that might not be a problem in one of the other uh, types of government because it's not an available option you know it, it, you know it's, one of those governance types might be around that you've got too much stuff and the other governments might be that you don't have any stuff so mm. someone who's in a regime where they have no stuff isn't going to struggle with the idea of having too much stuff if you get what I mean I, I, maybe they're yeah. just trying to identify what would be uniquely problematic yeah and he does he does say at a certain point um, it would just be ridiculous uh, he had a good term for it I can't remember what it is off the top of my head but it'd be just laborious and ridiculous to, to sit here and list every single uh, yeah. type of individual and every single type of government like it just they basically say they basically concede. Look, this is this is you know this is the the macro picture, the broad picture. <laughs> that yeah, I think he's something along the lines of you know like th this is a sketch or an outline. You know, we don't we don't have yeah. time for the for the the full painting or All whatever the it details. Is. I must say that made me laugh. Being up to episode eighteen as we are, that uh, <laughs> they're concerned about taking too long to talk about something. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine if they did we'd be like 18 of 80 <laughs> oh, I'd be like I, that's the difference between Plato and George R. R. Martin is Plato knows when to not go down that rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah alright well so let's see how, see how it plays out so he then goes on to say that there's this that, so Socrates' this whole thing is what I've just described is the ideal state he calls that an aristocracy and then he says there's other lesser um lesser governments um, and he lists the different types and there's uh, something called timocracy um, which we we're having a giggle at with Tim just then um, and that's supposed to be similar to the Spartan and the Cretan state um, and then I think what's below that there was uh, uh, oligarchy oligarchy yep then democracy and then tyranny so I think this week we're going to hit uh, we're going to hit the first two we'll hit uh, t t timarchy and oligarchy um, that was bad. That was all right. I nailed it. You got time, um, Marky. That was good. Yeah, <laughs> and then, so that yeah, name so they change for everybody playing along at home. So, uh, Tomarki or Timocracy, they work either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the but he sort of the the basic assumption of the what what he's doing here is that you've got the top one, his version, which is the very best, and then the other ones below it, and that they bleed into each other. So, a fault in one leads to the creation of the other. So the first one that he hits is timearchy. And he starts out by saying, well, how can you go from the perfect state, which I've described, to this? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And and just for those listening, uh, we are covering two this week and two next week. Uh, I was reading this chapter, waiting for a natural pause, and got to the end of the chapter. <laughs> I didn't realise until I turned to the last page. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we, we will... Um, basically it's four governance types so we're just going to stop at halfway and we'll do the other mm. half next week um, so if you're reading along at home and you overread, uh, well I did too so that's fine uh, <laughs> alright so, so let's, um, uh, let's go on to the timocracy let's yeah. have good food right <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting with this one I mean, you can tell uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of respect for this uh, form of government and the way they sort of speak about it um, and I think that they're sort of like, you know, tipping their hat a little bit to the, um, um, the Spartans and Cretans as well. Um, saying like, maybe it's not perfect, but it, it's still not bad. Um, because when they start talking about how it's going to sort of slide, you know, they're sort of saying, well, it's probably not going to happen straight away. If you know what I mean, it's, um, it, it's a, it's a pretty good government. So it's hard to kind of predict how it's going to start to sort of fall apart but um yeah, socrates he says, some weird mathematical stuff so oh yeah that but yeah we'll get into that but um yeah he, he says but when he's talking about the, the government sort of degenerating he goes but since all since all created things must decay even a social order of this kind cannot last for all time but will decline so that's kind of what he's saying yeah. Yeah, yeah, I for found sure. that interesting, that line. It made me think of a time when I was much younger and I was talking to my uncle about politics and he pointed out to me that one day our government will fall. And um, I remember just thinking, what? 
how's that possible? Like, <laughs> it never occurred to me before that conversation that everything has a finite lifespan in regards to, you know, politics and governments. And um, I think that was the beginning of me to, to start waking up and thinking about this stuff. That was a long time ago. I must have only been, I don't know, 16, 17. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I must admit reading this passage um, made me start thinking about that as well too. Um, I haven't thought about that for a little while, but um, yeah, t- totally um, good thing to keep in mind, I think, when you're thinking about this stuff in, a, in its whole state. Yeah. I mean, it's something I think of regularly at the moment with you know all the stoic reading I do. They're very big on memento mori and you know that nothing lasts forever, everyone will die. But it, you don't always think about it beyond the individual level and just having that reminder that all these things change, I was just like, oh, yeah. Correct. Absolutely. So yeah, you're um, right. Then he then he hooks into the math, doesn't he? Yeah, the math. Is yeah. Crazy. So, so this, <laughs> this was all about. It's really strange, actually, because for all of the discussions we've been having, uh, the Socratic method's been very logical. Um, generally, I've seemed to find, uh, find that it's sort of based on facts and you know. Um, and Good sense reason, of yeah. logical thinking and yeah, reason that sort of thing right uh and this just seemed like it was just such left field nonsense for uh <laughs> to sort of get brought out <laughs> but, but basically they were talking about um that people should be conceived on particular days and that um it's going to help sort of determine whether they're going to be um good and successful or whether they're sort of like evil or tainted sort of um people which is kind of bizarre um, and well, do you think, some... is he, are they referring specifically to their regimented breeding system that he wanted to put in place in his society? Is that, or is he, is he talking more so. broadly? I, I think it was just more broadly. And it's, I don't know if there's some like baseline sort of um, superstition or something like that, that had been sort of like almost like astrology or something, you know what I mean? Um, that was sort yeah. of sitting within their social structure at that point in time. That was sort of dictating that you know i don't know just using it as like a really sort of basic example if you're born on like an odd uh odd number you're going to be evil if you're born on an even number you're going to be a good person you know what i mean um, yeah he says this whole geometrical number controlling the process determines the quality of birth I'm like huh <laughs> yeah yeah so i just wasn't sure if there was some existing dogma around that at that particular time in ancient greece because it just seemed really off, off it brand. did feel out of place yeah yeah it did feel out of place it was like a, it was like a it was like a like a mad it was, it, it was like a, a huge appeal to authority mm. but it, it's sort of like this authority is just coming out of nowhere yeah but it seemed acceptable by like because nobody sort of questioned it or challenged it so it sounded like that was like a normal sort of process or something like that um yeah yeah kind of odd um do you think it's odd to us because we've separated astronomy and astrology Uh, quite possibly i mean yeah look i don't quite know where they were pulling that from but i it just has that sort of whiff of astrology about it so uh very much so yeah yeah well, yeah. at, at any rate, he, he basically says uh, when the guardians ignore this and make brides and bridegrooms inappropriate, this is what leads to the uh, to things sort of starting to go wrong. That, that's roughly what he's saying, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, I think, like, in particular, he's also talking about, I think, uh, interbreeding between the classes. And we know, yep. like, yep. with the perfect state, he's very specific about people having a role and a function and that if you're designated to be a, a person of uh, iron, so you're in the um, trade class or whatever it may well be, you know, that's where you stay. Um, if you're a person who's of the, you know, silver vein or what have you, and you're going to be a, a, a guardian, then that's where you, that's where you stay. Um, oh. and people have a fit purpose. So he's sort of talking about that that becomes less stringent and that, uh, I don't know, it's like almost like a polluting of the bloodlines is going to lead to their sort of downfall. Um, mm. And I guess having people in roles that maybe aren't, you know, 
well established for those f- functions or whatever it may well be you know it was funny tonight um when i got home the kids wanted to watch a movie so we watched uh marvel's shang shang chi and the legend of the ten rings and um little mm. spoiler alert if you haven't seen it fast forward 30 seconds uh, one of the side characters in that i haven't seen it okay oh, well <laughs> do you want the spoiler yeah lay it on me anyway. yeah, God, all right okay okay cool it's not sig- it's not massively significant and those who fast forwarded 30 fast forward another 30 <laughs> um so anyway <laughs> this this chick in there who's like a side character um goes to this place i won't say where and um she gets offered like a bow and she's like oh uh, and she's watching all these people do martial arts like kung fu stuff and she's like oh yeah like um wouldn't it be wonderful to just commit yourself to one trade all your life and like become really really good at it and you know that's something i've not been able to do and it's something my parents always want me to do and her like growth as a character was that she then took on this archery sort of uh fascination and started getting competent and then she found like meaning and purpose in that and an identity in it and i just i thought to myself that's hilarious (laughs) <laughs> what we've been reading about with um it's basically plato right? yeah plato yeah. might be onto something here <laughs> <laughs> anyway you're probably wondering at the start of that how the hell does this relate to that but that that's that's how we got there so you're welcome that's my little journey you brought it around yeah. full circle we're good we're good <laughs> um so yeah so like talking about the like the gold and the silver people as well <clears throat> they're saying that there'd be um, a, a pursuit and this is kind of what would help with that downfall um that there'd be a greater pursuit for wealth amongst the people who are sort of in those trade classes. And that was going to clash with the traditionalists who are maybe already sort of in that guardian class, um, who are, you know, rich in, uh, how do you put it? Virtue and practice, I guess, rather than sort of being sort of super focused on material wealth, but there'd be this kind of divide within the state about the pursuit of wealth versus the pursuit of virtue. And that they'd have to kind of reach a, a compromise where they sort of go, well, you know, why not both? If you see the meme, um, <laughs> so they sort of, yeah, have this sort of uncomfortable sort of compromise there, which is, is I think, what you know Socrates is sort of pointing to is starting to like pollute the perfect state because you know people are going to be starting to uh, you know look at what their neighbours got and uh, you know try to amass more wealth and find ways of spending it or stepping up the ladder and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Good old envy. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, they did also have a link there about the fact that they're going to become more warlike. Um, yeah. I couldn't remember that was like a, they were talking about degeneration of like focus in the education and non-trust of, um, philosophers, that kind of thing as well. And of music, um, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't quite sure where the music sort of came from, but I, I, I don't know. They're just sort of putting less importance on that and really just focus. I think on. I think maybe because when they look at war, war is a way of generating more money. Yep. Because con- conquering lands, conquering people, that's where you amass wealth. Yeah. And so there's just this sort of like focus on the warring side, and then. Um, so the education is more focused on the gymnastic rather than the, uh, uh, you know, music and literature and music, yeah. all that sort of side of things. Um, which I guess like if we've all, um, seen the, uh, you know, 300 movie, you know, everyone's got, got a vision in mind of <laughs> what Sparta <laughs> sort of looked like in the movies. I don't know whether that's a, a fair representation, but, um, yeah, because he basically says that uh, that'll push them towards um, uh, neglecting the true principles of rational philosophic education and overvaluing the physical at the expense of the intellectual training. So basically, because they're gearing more towards war as a result of their greed, they become more warlike and more soldier-like rather than mm. and, and ignoring that philosophic side, which I think... He also, as you see earlier in the book, relates to music um, and music and poetry and literature and things like that. Hmm. And I think he was so saying too, to... Ign- you go. Well, they give a description... Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, they give a description, like if... 
I don't know if we're up to it yet. Are we wanting to sort of summarise the democracy, what it means, what it looks like in the person? Or are we not up to that? Just um, yet? Well, I think we're... Yeah, we, we, uh, we can, but... So, is, essentially, I think the best... I can't remember where it was, but they sort of more or less say that um, democracy becomes this kind of more warlike, very much respect and honour-based society that um, values, yeah, that, that values physical and, and warrior attributes over, um, you know, more intellectual labours. I think it's, that's roughly what they're saying. The democracy is right. Yeah, and that they rule by fear as well was something that they were talking about yeah. there. It's like a, an, an iron fist, you know, over the, uh, you know, from the government. They're trying to control their people by, you know, rather than sort of having them. Um, uh, happy and participating in there, it's kind of having to sort of strong arm them. And so it's, it's just this sort of, you know, difference in style there. <clears throat> yeah. Well, interestingly, they point out that it's kind of like Glaucon. Yeah. They, when they start looking at the individual, they did point at Glaucon to start with, but then <laughs> pointed out a few other differences, but that was funny. <laughs> that made me laugh. I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's a strong dude. Like, I, I, I don't imagine I him that way he is. at all. I know, but I reckon he is because you remember there was that bit where they're talking about, oh, and you know, the best fighters, they they can basically bang whoever they want. Yeah. While they're on campaign, you remember that bit? Mm. And yeah, yeah. Glaucon's the one Glaucon's that brought that up. He's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're just, they're just just going oh and and what, what about this what about this and Glaucon's like yeah and, and if you're the best soldier you can pretty much do whatever you want right yeah <laughs> so uh, maybe he was just like uh maybe he was just like a, a good soldier or something yeah <laughs> but it also describes yeah. him later on like because Glaucon is here the whole time listen mm. listen to this bit here he should have more of self assertion and be less cultivated and yet a friend of culture and he should be a good listener but no speaker. Such a person is apt to be rough with slaves, unlike the educated man, who is too proud for that, and he will also be courteous to freemen and remarkably obedient to authority. He is a lover of power and a lover of honour, claiming to be a ruler, not because he is eloquent or on any ground of that sort, but because he is a soldier and has performed feat of arms. He is also a lover of gymnastic exercises and of the chase. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that does sound a bit like Glaucon. Glaucon's been a very good listener. He does but not much of a talker. <laughs> He loves the chase. He likes the chase. <laughs> <laughs> there was another term for that in our workplace years ago when the Greek boys were all there and they, they called it um, sniffers. <laughs> the guy was what a sniffer. Do I dare was, ask the, the background of that? No, it was like they're always smelling, like always trying to sniff for for their next score. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I, I think like as we start to talk about the individual, um, they're just sort of wrapped up by sort of saying, I think democracy was kind of a mix of good and bad. So they're saying that there's still yeah. some good things because they were sort of hanging on to some tradition and, um, you know, are trying to sort of have some of those, um, like honor is really important. And so that's kind of, uh, you know, part of that virtue, but then they're, they're starting to go the wrong way as far as like pursuing wealth and greed and all that sort of thing. Do you think Socrates um, is also giving Glaucon a bit of a nod? Like, you you know you know uh philosopher but you're a democracy you're, you're a pretty close second <laughs> like, yeah yeah you're not there yet champion but you're only one ring down you know it could be it, it seems like it's also like just a sort of a social acceptance too for like um you know looking at sparta and sort of saying they're doing things different over there but look it seems to be a pretty successful system for them hmm. i don't know um, I must say I don't know too much about the old Sparta days. I know what I saw in 300, which I'm sure is 100% historically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's legit. Um, and yep. pretty much my only other exposure is through freaking Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So, you know, yeah. I'm not well read on that I, at all. No, same same here. Um, I guess, um, yeah, look, it's interesting. It does come through in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but yeah, again, uh, I don't know how... Uh, <laughs> factually correct i don't i do know they do do a lot of research on that sort of stuff to try and keep it you know relatively historically um you know in line and uh in there you could sort of see the two different sort of systems kind of working and uh, 
that they were kind of at odds with each other, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, we can't really talk about uh, uh, video games being a uh, um, <laughs> yeah, source of truth. Source for, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's fair. <laughs> what did you guys think about his description of how, uh, like, how these types of young men um, come to be the way they are? Oh, about their mum yeah. and about their dad. <laughs> he has a good dig at a good dig at women here. <laughs> well, they all sort of join in the bandwagon on that one too, don't they? Oh, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they start with the story of a was it's like a a boy and and his father and like his father's trying to do things a traditional way and observe the virtues and the values and all that sort of thing and observes yeah, temperance he's a, he's and a, greedy. He's a good guy. Yeah. He's a good, he's a, he's a good man in a bad state. And because it's a bad state, he doesn't want to get involved in politics and all that sort of stuff. Cause he's, he's just interested in doing the good, which is kind of what, you know, Socrates says is, is the right way to go. But, um, so he avoids office and honors and lawsuits. Um, mm. Doesn't he's not greedy, so he doesn't try to make too much money. And um, basically, Socrates is, says because he's because he's a good man, um, his wife will start to um, resent him for it. Essentially, is what he's saying. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because of basically like looking at all the neighbors and that uh, or their husbands pursuing this, and uh, you know they're getting wealthier or they're getting more. You know, social standing, and we're not going anywhere. You know, uh, falling yeah. behind compared to everybody I'd else. Be, I'd be interesting to see what uh, what the wording in your book is, but in mine, it's uh, all this annoys her, and she says that the boy's father isn't a real man and is far too easygoing, and drones on with all the and then drones on with all the usual complaints that women make. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty silly, I think. Ours says uh, she is annoyed and says to her son that his father is only half a man and far too That's easygoing, right. adding all the other complaints about her own ill treatment, which women are so fond of rehearsing. That's it, yeah. And then Adam, what does Adam to say? Goes, well, and a dreary, a dreary lot of a dreary lot of them there are too. And then when <laughs> he goes, like uh, yes, said Adam Antis, they give us plenty of them. And their complaints are so like themselves. <laughs> I'm like, wow. He just wants to be back I'm on sorry, tour, ladies. right? Yeah. Out on the march with the boys. <laughs> That's what Adam matters. Or Glaucon's after. Yeah. Uh, this book's hilarious. Like, literally oh, yeah. 10 pages ago, equality. And then 10 pages later, it's like listening to my old uncles. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, well, I just like it that they're basically laying lay, laying the, the the generation the the degeneration of society they're kind of laying it squarely at, at the mother's feet <laughs> just <Yeah>. like <laughs> well society for us winding them up uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well they didn't just throw it at her feet did they because uh, they did say what was it ah, if you right. had uh, house slaves or what have you who would have been around there for many many years you know, they had those private well. conversations with the boy sort of saying, you know, when you come to power and this is, you know, your house and all that sort of thing, you know, you can't be so easy going. You've got to stand up and fight for your rights and, uh, you know, show people who's boss. Otherwise, people are going to walk all over you. So basically telling him to yeah. go out there and um, punch hard. Make your mark. Get your money. Yeah, make get your social standard, uh, social um, setting and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, so so then says, they go. Um, let's, oh, sorry, Ruben. Go. He says. He, so he basically says the, the the kid ends up being torn in two directions. His father's influence fostering the growth of his rational nature, and that of the others, and the influence of the others, his desire and his ambition. And since he's not, since he's not really at heart a bad chap, but has merely got but merely got into bad company, he takes a middle course between the two. Yeah, yeah. So it, it mm. sort of learns the lessons of, of virtue, but it's at the same time arrogant and hungry for power. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of the, the lessons of the guardians kind of get get lost on the way there through a couple of generations. I think is the idea. So that's the spark. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. All right. Well, let's move on to the oligarchy. Yeah. 
So I found this interesting reading. Yeah, yeah. so this is oligarchy by his definition is a society in which wealth is the creator of merit and that the wealthy control everything. Yeah, and they, they talk about the progression from a democracy to the oligarchy and just sort of saying that that initial sort of pursuit of wealth is just what's going to keep sort of snowballing and building. Um, so they get to that point where certain people have amassed enough wealth to start trying to manipulate laws and constitution to suit themselves. And that, that and that's kind of where that slippery slope is from where it's moved into that oligarchy, where they're, they're now starting to control that state mm. uh, from the position of yeah, power. Yeah, so the, the, accum the accumulation of wealth in private hands is what destroys the timarchy or democracy. Yep. Yeah, and, and I think that's sort of saying basically that the more money that people made, uh, the less they care about virtue and that really it becomes a situation where the rich men are honoured and the virtuous man is ignored, really, or or even laughed at, I think is kind of what they're implying, you know, that you're, yeah. you're just a stooge yeah. being taken advantage of, you know, when you, uh, you should be out there making that money money. Um, <laughs> And I think it's also about, you know, I think like almost like buying your citizenship was kind yeah. of the thing that they talked about as well. So, yeah, um, it creates like an elite class of wealthy people. Mm. Mm. So and, I'll just read um, those two those two paragraphs because it describes yeah. what you're saying. Um, so the first paragraph I wrote truth next to it. <laughs> um, so it goes, and so at last, instead of loving contention and glory, men become lovers of trade and money. They honor and look up to the rich man and make a ruler of him and dishonor the poor man. They do so. They next proceed to make a law which fixes a sum of money as a qualification of citizenship. The sum is higher in one place and lower in another, as the oligarchy is more or less exclusive, and they allow no one whose property falls below the amount fixed to have any share in the government. These changes in the constitution they effect by force of arms, if intimidation has already has not already done their work. So, yeah, it's like all the rich people were taking control, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. I've heard that, um, I've heard, I don't know what Russia is like these days, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, I've heard that that basically get got described as an oligarchy because all the money, when it kind of just got redistributed, uh, what do you call it redistributed to the to the rich friends of the the people in the government and it just created this um class of oligarchs so they're basically the rich people are, are running the country and calling the shots mm. um i don't know how accurate that is that's just a, a broad outline that i've heard here and there mm. Mm. but just like as a, as a yeah. contemporary mm. Mm. Yeah, I, the, the really interesting lesson they start to draw on now is that they, they talk about, I think, the the leadership coming from places of wealth rather than places of skill. And um, he sort of dredges up that example, which was sort of going back to the, uh, you know, the, 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 navigator. the pilot. Yeah, yeah the navigator. <laughs> and just sort of saying that, um, you know, what good is it if you've got a, you know, someone who's come from wealth who has no skill, you know, can they can they pilot the vessel? Um, or should you have somebody who's, you know, skilled in that task of, of doing it? And they're saying, well, you know, and so it is with leaders, you know, it's, um, it's even more important for the leader to have skill to do that job, job, not just to be some rich guy who wants to run the country. Hmm. Do you, um, I don't know, reading this, do you guys reckon there's some aspects of, of this we kind of seeing now? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's um, it certainly does sort of bring about a a bit of a question when you look at, you know, say like the US, for example. Um, you know, would you say that they have a a ruling class is sort of emerging of rich individuals who are you know pursuing their own interests in the state and pushing those agendas forward over the general population's wants. I don't know. 
Yeah, it's like it's obviously not as specific as what he describes, where you've got to have a certain amount of money to even be part of the, uh, you know, be part of the state. But I mean, let's face it, um, like to to run for office, for, from what I can tell from over here in Australia, to run for office over there, you need an awful lot of money. Um, mm. you know, yeah. if you if you're talking yeah. about high offices. <laughs> I mean, there was that. There was that. I can't think of the name. There was that truck trucker who recently won in one of the sort of the, one of the more small, the local. I don't, what do they call it? State or, or local elections or whatever. Yeah. Um. Mm. Like good, good on him, but um. I mean, th- that bloke's not going to be running for president because he's just not of that class. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of funding required, and even in Australia, like, uh, who who's been an independent that's got up as prime minister? Mm. Yeah, it's not a thing. Yeah. No, yeah, you're either Labor or Liberal. You you might come from a maybe a National Party as part of the Liberal Coalition, but you've got to be, you know, in that big boys club, so to speak. Well, the other way, the other place that I kind of see it is if you look at the really, um, like even more broadly, like on an international scale, you know, the Jeff Bezos and the, and the people that run, what's that bloke, Zuckerberg that runs Facebook and all those sort of people. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think, I think you'd have to be na- naive not to see that they enact a fair whack of um, influence on a lot of countries these days. And it, that, that, that kind of makes me think of a, almost like oligarchy on a, on a huge scale. Sure. Yeah. Of course, control of media and and uh, the, the general diatribe, you know, and whether that's independent. Uh, I know I sort of sent that little uh, tweet somebody had put out about, I think, like media and, you know, whether it's their job to <clears throat> report what's out there and, you know, let people decide what's right and wrong or for um, the media to present a specific viewpoint on whether something's right or wrong, you know, and what that position is. Oh, that was is. the uh, the Thomas the Thomas Sowell quote. Yeah. Too many journalists yeah, see yeah, their yeah. work as an opportunity to promote their own pet political notions rather than a responsibility to inform the public and let their readers and viewers decide for themselves. Mm. Um, and apparently, recently, a report came out recently from the US that um, they traced some of the the money that goes into elections and and Facebook through huge amount of money at some of the elect uh, some of the uh, some of the electorates over there that's no surprise yeah, i mean like yeah political donations are uh, a massive thing and uh yeah it's absolutely about a, a bit of you know you scratch my back i'll scratch yours you know anyone who thinks it's not um <laughs> is kidding themselves yeah um, so that sounds an awful lot like what he's describing in terms of um uh, changing the laws to suit the suit the rich. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as he sort of delves into a bit more of that too, I, I think some of that description there too was about the decisions, um, you know, being made for the benefit of the wealthy rather than the benefit of the the masses, and the masses not really having much influence over the the, the laws and sort of changes that get enacted upon that government. Um, yeah. And so I. I guess you could sort of ask, you know, where is the lay person sort of getting what they want out of a government? You know, are they able to get what they want or are they only getting what they want when it falls into line with what the wealthy class want? Yeah. It's interesting because you you do sort of, this is an old, old book, but there's some of the patterns he's laying out. You can sort of, I'm not saying that we live in a straight up oligarchy like he's describing now, but no. you certainly see some of the patterns. Yeah, correct. Definitely. Yeah, yeah that's quite interesting. So, so what does he describe as the character, the individual character, oligarchic character? Uh, I think he calls him a spendthrift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, I, I heard it. There was another... I, came across another translation of it and they used the term miser <laughs> which is a that's a term that i hadn't really heard before miser but, but he used the miser in in ours as well but it, it sort of sounds like there's a there's kind of like two things they talk about there's one there's the spend spendthrift who's um you know just pursuing all of the uh, earthly delights that he can kind of spend his cash on and uh sort of rather than 
uh, Tim, has he put it maybe like around like buying what he really sort of um, what's necessary versus what's unnecessary and just saying that, um, you know, they're just into getting into whatever they can. And then I think the miserly was more like the example of the person who's lost everything and has rebuilt their sort of fortune from basically being a massive tight ass and screwing down mm-hmm. everything they can on their way to try and reamass their their, their fortune. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's so miserly because, you know, that's what they care about is trying to get that, that status and that wealth back up, but then they won't spend any of it because they're... Um, or they're just obsessed with the money yeah they also talk about how they create two classes and then they can't go to war properly because if they arm the poor then they're afraid of the poor <laughs> yeah <laughs> really interesting i thought um, yeah i thought that was pretty funny what did you yeah what did you think about that um well i i'll just read the first part about what Lockman's talking about it says a man may sell all that he has and another may acquire his property yet after the sale he may dwell in the city of which he is no longer a part being neither trade or artisan nor horseman nor hoplite but only a poor helpless creature so it goes from very rich to very poor um and then it goes uh but think again in his wealthy days while he was spending his money was a man of this sort of wit more good to the state for the purposes of citizenship or did he only seem to be a member of the ruling body although in truth he was neither a ruler nor subject but just a spendthrift. <laughs> so it's like, he's yeah. just going to throw money around because he's stupid. <laughs> Doesn't really do anyone any yeah. good. No. Um, but yeah, coming back to the arming um, the masses and being afraid of the masses. Uh, yeah, I can see that. I don't really have any commentary on it. It just, it makes sense. If you're, if, if yeah. you're a, how do you say this nicely? Like, if you're a grub to your people and then you arm them, yeah yeah they've been knocking on your door that's right <laughs> it's like the cave it's like the uh, it's like the troll handing out pitchforks <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you just don't do it it's just interesting I think the division that they sort of laid out with this example between the rich and the poor and just saying more or less that because uh, the division's just so massive when you start going into this thing that you know you have that absolutely like dirt poor um in this society where he's just saying, you know, you just shouldn't have that in your society, which is interesting. Um, and then I think he was sort of basically drawing the line to say that it, it's just, it's linked to more criminality within your society as well. Cause he talks about like the yeah. person yeah. rogues and what have you, that'll, you know, do you away in an alley to, you know, get your purse off you or whatever it may well be. Yeah. He talks about um, uh, flying drones, um, which, hmm made me laugh because this weekend I was flying my drone <laughs> taking footage yeah. of all the places I was staying at I don't think he means those drones I think he means bees he's saying there's like yeah. people some of them have stingers and some of them don't and uh, is that your interpretation did you visualize bees or wasps when you read this part yeah that's exactly what I thought of too what does yeah. your translation say Ruben does it say drones or does it say it says drones yeah it says drones too yeah, okay so I'm guessing it's some. I, I just assumed it was some kind of worker bee or something. Yeah. So they're saying it's a, in an oligarchical states. Do you not find paupers? Yes, he said. Nearly everybody is a pauper who is not a ruler. Um, and so then we may be so bold as to affirm there are also many criminals to be found in them, rogues who have stings, and whom the authorities are careful to restrain by force. So yeah, that's what they're saying. Hmm. Yep. Yep. There was one um, one <laughs> good little. There you go. Uh, I was just going to say it was um interesting too. They're talking about going to uh, going to war as well. That basically saying that um, the uh, the the leader would be unable to kind of defend themselves in the event because basically be out of breath because he's never done anything in all his life. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So he, of one of the oh, one bit. One bit I found interesting is he, he basically boils down the uh, the character, the uh, oligarchic character, that um, they have no moral conviction, no taming of desire by reason, but only the compulsion of fear. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, there's one little uh, quote I saw a bit earlier. So he's a shabby fellow who saves something out of everything and makes a purse for himself. And this is a sort of man whom the vulgar applaud. Is he not a true image of the state which he represents? He appears to me to yeah. be so. At any rate, money is highly valued by him as well as by the state. You see, he is not a man of cultivation, I said. <laughs> so he's a high taxation socialist? What is he? <laughs> well, actually, because uh, they made that comment there about uh, them trying to avoid tax, and I, I couldn't help but think of Elon. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's exactly uh, what they're saying. You know, they've gotten so wealthy that they see themselves above the government and that they shouldn't pay taxes any longer. <laughs> I was like, uh, well, don't, you, <laughs> don't you see that with the big gov, like the big multinational companies these days, like they'll put the mm. office, you know, they'll put an office over in Dublin or something because they can avoid this tax here. And then, you know, they'll send this bit over there offshore. I, I, I mean, doing they're trying to make money. So I, I think yeah. doing that with Australia, they had, they were claiming that every transaction. So if I get my phone out and I buy a song right now, they were arguing that transaction didn't happen in Australia. It happened overseas where their server is. So they didn't need to pay tax here because that transaction yeah. happened on their server overseas. And that, that was their, that was like one of the examples of their loopholes. As far as I recall. Did they get away with that? Uh, I recall them getting away for it for some time. I don't know if it was ever closed. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that was the example. So, mm. yeah, it might have, well, Actually, full disclaimer, it may not have been iTunes, but I remember it being a provider like that. Yeah, yeah, I think it was, it was an electronic yeah. transaction. Yeah. What, what do you think, just out of interest, because uh, I know you are a bit of a fan of the Musk, um, and look, I think he does some like uh, super clever stuff as well, but he, he's pretty open about the fact that uh, he doesn't feel he should be paying taxes. What do you reckon? Should well, everyone get have to pay taxes? Or if you've uh, contributed enough to society, do you think that they've uh, earned their place to be tax-free? Well, what I saw about that was he wasn't saying he wasn't going to pay taxes. He was saying he wasn't going to pay taxes on things that hadn't paid dividends. So people are saying he needs to pay taxes on all of his shares, his share market value. But his point is, until he withdraws that, it's it's meaningless it can be worth 12 billion today and 1200 bucks tomorrow it's not money yeah, that he's actually that. taken out and put in his pocket so mm -hmm. his point is until i take that money off the share market and put it in my pocket you can't tax me on it because it's not actually yeah real money gonna yeah. be like going to a business owner he has, he has a business that's worth a hundred thousand dollars but he doesn't turn a profit for 12 months and the government comes and comes along and goes well you owe us 10 percent Kind of like that, yep. yeah. And they, and, they, and they try to tax him on the worth of his business rather than what his business actually earned. Is that yeah, kind of... I guess in that model, you'd have to ask if, uh, you know, if he does make a loss the following year, does that mean the government has to pay him back money? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that too. And I mean, the, the profit and loss stuff is very grey. I'm yeah. not saying the business world is completely ethical, um, but mm. I, I think he's point on that particular issue is valid and if the laws were changed he strikes me as the sort of guy that would pay if it was the law but because it isn't the law and people are saying he should yep. do something as if it is the law he's pointing out well that's not the way the law works and i'll pay the tax when it's applicable which is at this point not there so you know yep. if he's found a way to outsmart all the people that wrote those taxation laws well as far as i'm concerned kudos to him man but you know the, the governments have to get their act together and their ass in the gear i mean they're so slow at legislating anything by the time they catch up to crypto and everything else the horse is bolted mm. anyway so but yeah so yeah I, that's my opinion i think he's within his rights to say no to that um as long as it's legal yeah that's a proposed sense. law yeah mm. yeah which, yeah, it does sound like BS, to be honest. But... <laughs> it sounds like people who are envious trying to take something that's not theirs. Yeah, he's always getting slammed. Plus, 
Yeah, and plus these days, I mean, I don't, I don't trust Elon Musk as far as I could throw him, but I'd rather him have the money than the government at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly does more with it. <laughs> certainly does more with it. So, all right, let's keep going. Uh, anything else we need to say? I, I think that was I about think... the end of the uh, oligarchy, really. Um, yeah, that's and then, then yeah, then they go into democracy. So yeah, that's that's, yeah. that's that was it. All right. Well, um, oh, this is the last thing. So can we uh, any longer doubt then that the miser and money maker answers to the oligarchical state? There can be no doubt. That's their conclusion. Yeah. No, so the sense. oligarchical state goes to the greedy. Basically. So Elon Musk belongs to the oligarchical state. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not just him. There's plenty of them out there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, um, that seems like to um, the guy. He doesn't live in a very uh, modest sort of uh, like bungalow attached to SpaceX or something like that. Uh, that was one of the things I heard him talk to Rogan about. Was he was selling all of his stuff because um, yeah, he was like, yeah, people would be like, hey, billionaire, why do you have? 11 houses and 50 cars and he was like sell them all then what can you say <laughs> yeah so um, I do respect that about him more than one occasion he's worked down to the point where he's he could lose it all within a week and um, mm. he's managed to dig it back out every time so I recall watching one interview with him and he was living off two minute noodles for a couple of weeks because that's all he could afford and he was sleeping yeah. in the office that he was working in so he'd literally, literally mm. wake up and work and only stop to sleep. So, you know, people yeah, um, make out like he's, you know, not doesn't deserve this, but, man, the amount of effort he's put in, it didn't yeah, lean in his lap, uh, that's for sure. I don't know that much about him, but mm. he doesn't strike me as the type who is trying to uh, enforce his will on other people, which is more like uh, the impression I get from people like Bezos or... Zuckerberg or whatever his name is they, they seem to be a lot more intent on uh, you know influencing and controlling other people but Elon doesn't seem to be like that but I mean who knows how do you, how do you really know from all the way down here hmm. I think he's just a legitimate business person which is why he doesn't like his companies being unionized because he knows that they cost more I think he's all about the cost he just tries to do things as efficiently and as quickly as possible to get maximum hmm. output which is that ethically and morally correct? Probably not, but you can make the same argument against science. You know, is science at its core ethically and morally, morally correct? Tough Unknown. question. It's a tough question. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's not, you know, he's not doing what Russia's doing. He's not making space garbage up there. <laughs> he's trying to get internet for everybody in places that can't get it. He's trying to fix people with brain damage um, hmm. he's trying to bring about the electric car um, which I have my issues about batteries in particular their environmental impact but you can't deny that he is passionate and what he thinks he should do he goes and has a crack so I respect yeah, that well, at, least he's build, at least he's building things you know what I mean Yeah, that's, that's, I'm more often sceptical of the things like i'm not saying facebook and, and youtube aren't great things and can be great things but to, the, to some extent they're not tangible they're not building tangible things the same way that uh, someone like elon musk does yeah correct well i think the thing is too that um you know it's interesting he, I, he looks at what he can achieve in his lifetime i think and sometimes he mm. gets little ideas He's like, that'd be a really cool thing to develop, but I just don't have time to focus on that because I've got 15 other things going on. So I'm just going to put this idea out there and someone else can run with it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, give the guy credit. Like most people would try and uh, option it or like do something with it to try and, you know, monetize it anyway. You know what I mean? But he, he does throw some um, some interesting ideas just straight out and just sort of go, well, yeah. someone else take this and run with it, see what you reckon. But I think he also made his spaceship designs open source I think it was yeah, really? spaceship designs like there's something I can't remember if it was out of Tesla but he made one of the major projects he's working on he made it open source so other people can see how they do it and make recommendations mm. and try it out themselves so mm. 
I think that's pretty impressive. Yep. All right, well, let's uh, jump to the pub for lots of us. And, uh... okay. There's our lovely segue music and our set segue image. And, uh, yeah, so drifting. Drifting in Falls of Five. <laughs> <laughs> What is it to drift? What is drifting? What is the ultimate drifting? <laughs> no. <laughs> Falls of Five, uh, I haven't played much the last few days from being away uh, in beautiful Mudgee. Uh, in fact, I might actually, for those who watch us on YouTube, I might put a little bit of footage from the drone uh, at the mm. end of this episode so those watching from overseas can have a glimpse of what it looks like over in uh, our place of what we call our country area in uh, regional New South Wales um, but yeah you guys have been playing a heck of a lot of Forza how, how are you finding it local? yeah uh, look I haven't played like tons and tons but um, no look I'm, I'm really enjoying it I, I think Rubes had sort of said kind of the the deal is it's a bit of you know more of the same but that's not a bad thing um, it's a franchise that's got a particular kind of format that I think we all sort of get in there and enjoy but uh I haven't actually done too much drifting I have to say I've been doing all kinds of other stuff but uh the um they've got some sort of fun adventure campaigns and stuff so I've been doing a lot of that sort of stuff for the moment and uh doing my other sort of usual jam which is just I just like uh, I spend as much time sort of building and designing cars and liveries and stuff like that as I do actually driving because just being a car guy, uh, I like to play with the cars, so that's uh, that's my jam. <laughs> yeah, nice. How about you, Ruben? You've been throwing down the gauntlet to one of our mates, Rift. <laughs> yeah, the, one of the great things about that game is that you've got a friends list, and it shows you what what their scores are on particular challenges. So we've been having a having a good time trying to beat each other on the drift zones and and so on and so forth. The rivalry is great fun. Um, has, has your old man tried that game yet, Timmy? No, he's still just going hard on Destiny 2. He loves it so much. He's way <laughs> higher than I am on that game. I've really got to catch up. I love that game. I've got so much merchandise for that game on my shelf here. I've, I love that game so much. But I just, you know, you know what it's like when you've got the kids and, and the job. And, you know, yeah. I sacrifice gaming time to do this podcast every week if I wasn't doing the podcast I'd be gaming but uh, I thought this was important and I'm really enjoying it so I don't know I, I think I enjoy it more than gaming which is quite uh, feels almost what's the strong word words there? yeah her heretical that's what, that's what I was looking for <laughs> but um, oh that's one other thing I'll say when I was in Mudgee I did a lot of reading I was getting into the the Odyssey hmm um, the introduction for that book from the guy that did the translation was a fifth of the book. Mm. Oh. And it used to get sung by bards at uh, palaces and things that would take like 30 hours to sing this story. So I think it was the equivalent of HBO. <laughs> day, that people would go to the palace and listen to you know, Tonight on the Odyssey <laughs> and uh, get their 30 minutes or one hour of singing. How are you finding it so far? Really cool. Uh, there was a, uh, I, I spoke to the old man today. I recall him watching a movie with Kirk Douglas. Uh, yeah, I think it. I've seen that. Yes. So I'm like, I'm going to yeah, rewatch that one. movie once I've read the book. I'm sure it'll be horrible, <laughs> but compared yeah. to today's scene, it's, yeah, it'll be good. Mm. And uh, I was also uh, turning the pages on the Book of Wisdom from the Catholic Bible. It's one of the okay. books that are removed from the Protestant Bible that I have used all my life. Um, so I've decided I've got my hands on a copy of a Catholic Bible and I'm trying to read through those books I haven't read before. So I did a lot of reading. It was a lot of reading. It was a good, good weekend. Mm. Good on you, mate. Well, uh, I should have done. <laughs> yeah. It's been a wet weekend. Haven't made the most of it, though. <laughs> all this week is meant to be rainy. Next five or mm. six days. Right. There you go. No motorcycling for me. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right. Well, uh, if you're listening, thanks for listening. Um, and uh, 
you know, as usual, uh, your hosts. It's been Tim, Lachlan, and Ruben. And uh, remember, the Republic wasn't built in a day, and neither are middle-aged men. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Have a good night. See you later. See ya.